series on identity. And in that series, we told a story, or in that, um, it was obstacles to our identity. And we told a story of a man who was found naked and beaten behind a Burger King, had no idea what had happened to him when he came to in the hospital. They realized that he had total amnesia, total amnesia. And for years, uh, they still have not been able to help him figure out who he was and what had happened to him. No recollection. I asked the question, if you had total amnesia, do you think that you would be the exact same person as you are right now? If you could not remember your childhood, your upbringing, things that had happened to you, good things or bad things, do you think you would still live your life the exact same way with no memory of who you used to be. You know, and part of it uh, I got from a, a movie that I saw called Blind Spot or something like that, where they found this woman in a duffel bag and she had no idea who she was. And, and now that she couldn't remember who she was, she was a completely different person. She, uh, at first she was a terrorist and now she was trying to protect the country uh, because she lost all her memory of to who she used to be. I wonder if I would be a different person or not. I wonder if I would behave differently, not remembering what my parents taught me as a child. And we ended on sun, last Sunday asking a question, if you only had the Bible as the resource to figure out your identity or to figure out who you are or how you were supposed to live your life, do you think you would live differently than you're living right now? And in fact, that's pr pretty much what Christianity is all about, is that we are to depend on the Word of God to teach us and to lead us in our everyday lives. So as we are studying this topic out, I found a story in the book of Genesis, chapter 35, and I'm going to read it to you this morning, and we're going to break it down. It says this, then they moved from Bethel, on from Bethel, and this is Jacob and Rachel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had Great difficulty. Say great difficulty. She had great difficulty. And as she was having this great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't despair, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni, but his father named him Benjamin. So I want to pull some truths out of here today and paint a picture for you. You see, Rachel began to give birth and was having great difficulty. One thing I realize in discovering our destiny is sometimes giving birth to our destiny can be very difficult. Sometimes it can be very difficult to get what God put in you, out of you, to do. Sometimes it's not so easy to do what God has called you to to do. You see, the reason why I'm using this word destiny is because I believe that your destiny and your identity are knit together. What God has created you to be, being your destiny, is part of your identity. They kind of go hand in hand here. What God has created me to be is what I will be known for and what I'll be known as. And many times, someone or something will come along and try to stop your destiny. When I was born, <clears throat> I was born in February in the middle of a snowstorm. I was born in Delaware, uh, Wilmington, Delaware. And I was born a little over a month premature. The doctors came in to my mom and dad and they said, hey, listen, uh, you know, obviously this baby is born premature. His lungs are severely underdeveloped. So I was in an incubator full of oxygen, helped me breathe, all that kind of stuff. They said... Uh, Best case scenario, he'll have some form of asthma the rest of his life. But don't think that he's going to be the kind of kid that runs around and screams a lot. <laughs> well, even from birth, even from a young age, there has been things and forces trying to deter my calling, my destiny. And, and I wonder if you can look back in your own life 
and see that there should have been situations, there should have been circumstances that should have taken you out, but they did not take you out. Where things could have killed you, but they did not kill you. Things that could have taken your destiny or turned you down a different road, but did not. I, I, in my own life, man, accident after accident, major illness after major illness, things trying to come and stop where I was supposed to go and supposed to be in my life. Same thing right here with baby ben -Onin. Take his life. Mm. I would tell you this, don't be afraid when it seems difficult to follow your destiny. I think it might be kind of difficult to pack up a young family and move to another state believing that God has called you there to do that. Sometimes it's very difficult to reach a goal. Let me put it this way. If it's easy to accomplish a goal, you never dreamed big enough in the first place. Everyone has dreams of six-pack abs when they buy a treadmill. You research that treadmill. You're going to buy the top-of-the-line treadmill. It has the heart rate monitor to keep you right in the sweet spot of fat burning, and now it hangs your clothes. Why? Because getting up at 6 a.m. to get your behind on it is hard. Right? Even that six-minute abs is hard two minutes in. Come on now. Don't be alarmed if it feels difficult to reach or accomplish something that you believe you're supposed to do. I think that great things come through difficult times. Now, I don't think that God is in the art of creating difficult times to try to teach you something, but I do believe that God can use the difficult times in life to help you through and to get you stronger. You see, it is through the process of the birth canal that strengthens the spine of a child. That helps them get the strength so their head is not always so bobbly, right? One thing I've learned is discovering your destiny comes at a cost. It comes at a cost, and I think that cost is something called time. Time. And the more I've been, it been, it been here at the church and, and, and running things uh, that my dad retired, I've learned that time is probably the most prized commodity I have is that time has become very expensive. Time is very expensive. And so, sometimes, sometimes it's not worth my time to go do something even though I'm being paid for it. Come on now. Because sometimes it takes the time away from your family and from your children. Come on. Things come at a cost. It's not going to be easy to find your destiny or your identity but it will be worth it. Now watch this. In verse 17, the midwife says something to Rachel that boggles my mind. She says, don't despair, for you have another son. So she's saying, it's okay if you want to give up on this son that you're giving birth to, because remember, you still have another son. Let him die. Don't let this thing kill you. Let, let it die. Let, 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 let the baby die because you have another son. You know one thing I found in finding my identity and my destiny? If I create a plan B, I very many times have to live by plan B. So you have a backup plan. It's okay. You got the backup plan. Just, just settle for the backup plan. Do you know, we, 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 I've been around in church a long time, 35 years I've been in church. Most people who come with a prenuptial agreement have to use it. They normally have to use it because, yeah, I want this to work, but wonder if it doesn't work out. Well, then where was the faith? Was the faith in plan A or was the faith in plan B? Come on. There's going to be something that comes along that is going to try to get you to abort your identity. Things in life come along that try to get you to abort your mission, to prematurely give up when things get difficult. Her, 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 maid and her, her midwife is saying, you still have plan B. You don't have to do this. 
If it's too difficult, it's okay to give up. We've done this as a generation, you know. Our kids sign up for sports. They get halfway through the season, their team isn't winning, and we let them quit. Now, I got to tell you something. I played Little League for a long time. I don't know if my team ever won a game. We had a, one of our Little League teams was named Joy Mufflers. Joy Mufflers never won a single game. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, it was rough. And I would come home, Dad, I'm quitting. I don't want to play this anymore. I don't like to lose. Anybody here like to win? I'm a sore loser. I'm such a sore loser, I will change the rules of the game. I'll, I'll cheat. I will, I will straight up cheat. I will, I'll cheat. Because I want to win. My dad would tell me I didn't raise a quitter. I didn't raise a quitter. And, and listen, I know, I know, sell, Little League, who cares? I was never going to be Derek Jeter. Right? I could barely hit the ball. The point wasn't whether I was ever going to be something great in Little League. The question is, will I ever be anything great in life? If we gave up every time things got difficult, do we give up every time things get difficult? Other people will come along and try to get you to abort your mission. Others will try to talk you out of what you're supposed to do. I mean, this even happened to Jesus. In Matthew 16, 22, Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, listen, I have to go away. The Romans are going to come in. They're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me up. They're going to rough me up a little bit. They're going to put nails in my wrist and my feet. They're going to put me on a cross. I'm going to die. And Peter comes along. Peter, a.k.a. Big Mouth, he walks in and he says this in Matthew 16, 22. Peter looked, took Jesus to the side and began to rebuke him. He said, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. He's saying, you don't have to do this. Let somebody else do this. Do you know what Peter's really saying here? This is what most people do. Jesus, what am I going to do without you? This wasn't about Jesus in this moment. This was about Peter. You don't have to do this because I need you in my life. I need you to walk with me. I need you to talk with me. Let somebody else do this. Jesus looks at Peter in verse 23, and he says, and if you've ever read your Bible, you know this one. He says, get behind me, Satan. You want to say it to your spouse sometimes? <laughs> get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. And you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. What would have happened if Jesus was like, you're right, Peter. I mean, because I was just in the garden of Gethsemane, and I was begging God, if there's a way out, get me out. And now, you, now here's, <laughs> here's my greatest, my greatest, I hate this word, confirmation. Yes, Peter, you gave me the confirmation because I really don't want to do it anyway. So now you're just confirming what I already don't want to do. Can I just tell you guys something for, for real? You don't need confirmation when you really hear the Holy Spirit. You know what you're really doing? You're saying, I didn't really like the first answer. But now that someone else says it, okay, now I guess I have to do it. All right, y'all, I'm just being for real. I'll preach it how it is. Because we throw that out there. We throw it out there. Well, I'm just so glad you said it because now I can believe it. Now I can do it. So now, so now you're in faith? Were you in faith first? No. Okay. I wonder if Jesus was like, man, thank you, Peter, because I really didn't want to do this anyway. We'll wait for somebody else to come hang on a cross and die for the sins of the world. In that moment, Peter was trying to talk Jesus out of his destiny, which then would have robbed him of his identity as Savior of the world. He was called. His destiny 
His identity was to be the savior of the world. And there was only one man qualified to hang on a cross to pay the price for all eternity. There's some things inside of you that only you can do in this world in your lifetime because that's what you were created to do. That's heavy. That's heavy. Because I think too many times we don't take time to sit back and say, hey, what's the purpose of life? What's the purpose of life? Is it just to have fun? Have fun and die. Really? I, I, I think that the sum of my life, what it totals up, is supposed to be something more than fun. I think fun should be a big part of it. But I think I'm on this earth for someone else. I think you're here for someone else. That your life should make a difference at some point. Even Satan came to Jesus three times in the wilderness and tried to rob his identity from him. See, people are going to come along and they're going to try to impose what they want for you on your life. But people cannot see what you see for your life. People cannot see what you see. And listen, you're just wasting your time trying to show them. I think too many times we live our lives trying to prove something. I got to prove myself. How about you just be you? And by you being you, it'll prove who you are. I'm going to say something else. People can't hear from God for you. I've seen too many Christians spend a lot of money running around the world trying to get a personal prophecy. I'm going to stand on a healing line. I'm going to stand on a prayer line for four hours to wait for somebody to come tell me what God could have told me in the shower. (laughs) Then you know what happens? Somebody comes down with a really nice suit on. They lay hands on you. say, oh, God wants to say to you X, Y, Z. And now you live your whole life trying to live up to what that guy said about you instead of what the word says about you. And you lose direction. You lose direction. He said he'll show you things to come. He'll show you the next step. But now you're trying to chase a prophecy and you don't even know what your next step is. Don't we do this, man? We want the end before we even begin. We want to go on Wikipedia and look up the storyline before we even watch the opening scene. We're trying to do this in our own lives. Mm. If you don't discover your story, someone else will try to write it for you. Someone else will try to write it for you. I don't want to live the life that someone else is writing for me. Someone else on earth here. Someone else who doesn't really know what I can do. I want to know the story of the creator, of what he wrote for me. What did my creator write? Here's the point I want to get to today. That was was good stuff. That was the lead up to what I want to get to today. In verse 18 it says this. As Rachel breathed her last breath, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni. Now, Benoni, macaroni, whatever. We say, what's in the name? So what? She called him Benoni. The reason she called him Benoni was because Benoni means son of my trouble. Son of my pain. In fact, it was somewhat of a curse. I curse you, child, for what you've put me through, what you're doing to me. Could you imagine... Living with an identity that meant the child who killed its mother. What kind of destiny would he have fulfilled living by that name? Mm. You see, there's always going to be labels and tags and identities that people try to put on you to keep you from being who God truly created you to be. It's easy to fulfill the identity as a troubled youth. If, if we would look back even at my own life, 
I think they would put somewhat of a troubled youth tag on me. But, man, growing up in Scottstown, that's just what we did. We fought and we vandalized stuff. It was just, it's what it was. You know, I didn't know. I mean, that, there wasn't a whole lot to do besides that. It looked, troubled youth, troubled youth. It's easy to be troubled. Just give in to every evil desire you have, and you can be a troubled youth. That's easy. You know what's difficult? To be a leader. Because you're, never a, you're not actually a leader until there are people who want to follow you. Just because someone has a position of authority does not mean they're a qualified leader. Because there's a lot of people who have high qualified positions that are not leaders at all. And there are people who do not have any great position, but people follow them. If you look at a young man named David who was anointed to be king, people became, began to follow him while he was still hiding in a cave. It was not because he was sitting on a throne. Mm. With this identity of troubled or trouble, his future would have been filled with pain. And what I see is that many times people put labels on you because of their own problems. People put labels on you because of their own selfish reasons. For example, maybe you've been called stupid before. St you're just stupid. Do you know what the truth is? The person who called you stupid is just a really bad teacher. See what they're saying is, because you can't get what I'm trying to teach you the first time, there must be something wrong with you. It couldn't be because I'm a horrible teacher. It couldn't be because, because I have no patience to teach. It couldn't be because I have no idea how to articulate the topic in which I'm trying to share to you in a way that you can understand, so you must have the problem. This is not what we do. When we can't win an argument, we revert to name calling. And if you really want to win the fight, you just say a curse word. I'm just being for real. Ah, shut them up. I win. I won the argument. Yay. Now you got to go get in bed with that person that you just said that with and not talk. Lay there. Stare at the ceiling. Silly. But this is what we do. We tag someone with a name or an identity because we didn't get our way. Adam, God says to Adam, why'd you do this? He said, it wasn't me. It couldn't have been me. It was her. Give me my rib back, woman. Woman says, it wasn't me. You spit and made him. You formed me. It's not me. It's that serpent. See, because it could never be me. I'm perfect. If that woman would just submit, if everyone else would just change around me. And so we tag people who they are based upon what we can get or not get from them. Right? Come on. But thank God the Father walks in. Thank God the Father walks in. I thank God the Father walked into my life. The Father walks in and says, wait, 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 hey, would you just name my son? Would you just name my son? He's the 13th child of Jacob, 12 sons, one daughter. He's the youngest. He's number 13. What, wait, wait, what did you just name my son? Son of your trouble? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. If you were alive right now, I'd slap you. No, 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 no. <laughs> he said, he said, your name will be Benjamin. Your name will be Benjamin. You know what Benjamin means? Son of my right hand. In this, in this time period, 
The right hand meant authority. The right hand meant strength. So in a moment's time, he went from being son of trouble to son of strength. There's something powerful about a name. We, we took a lot of time when we were naming our children um, because we wanted to make sure that we gave them the proper names for what they were going to do. We, we, we spent a lot of time. I learned this lesson early in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. We had a dog. Yep. We got this dog from a breeder, and the breeder had named the dog Chainsaw. <laughs> Chainsaw, yep. This dog could just chew through a bone and doors and trim and shoes and slippers and he did. He would chew everything. Chainsaw. Reckless dog. Um, you know my dad. Maybe you know my dad. Got his 45. I'm going to kill this dog. Chewed my shoes. The dog's going to die today. No. See, back then you could do stuff like that. No, he didn't do it. I'm just saying. He was upset. No. Let's change his name. Let's change his name. Let's stop confessing that he's a chainsaw. Let's stop confessing that he's reckless. Let's stop confessing that he's destructive. Let's stop calling him by this name. And let's, so we changed the name to Pepper. Easy. Um, Pepper was a black cocker spaniel. Sweetest dog you ever want to meet? Change his name, stop chewing on everything. Believe it or not, change his name, stop chewing on everything. Listen, I know. No one else got to know, but I know how that situation went down. We, we all saw it. And so when we were talking about naming our kids, I wanted to make sure that I named my children in a manner in which suited where they were going to go. Because there's something powerful about a name. You see, Jacob, Benjamin's father, knew best. The father stepped in to change his name. And I, and, I, and I wrote this question. Have you been living up to the expectations of the wrong name? Have you been living up to the expectations of the wrong name? Had, although his name being Benjamin, was he only living up to the expectations of Benoni? Was he just living up to being a son of trouble or has he stepped into being the son of his father's strength? So many times I think we live by the wrong name. And I'm not talking about the name that our parents give us, but I believe the name that God would put on us. Jacob named his son Benjamin, son of my strength, son of my right hand. And one thing that I have learned is that people do not enjoy following wimpy people. We don't enjoy following wimpy people. We don't. Believe it or not, we like following people that are willing to fight for us, stand up for us, protect us, keep us. And if Benjamin only lived by the name Benoni, then he would not have stepped into his destiny of being the leader of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin being one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, Jacob, Jacob's name meant heel grabber. Do you remember this? Jacob and Esau, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Uh, Esau came out first, but Jacob was holding on to the heel. It's because he was always competing to be firstborn, stole the birthright, the whole nine. But in this moment, when, when God is calling Jacob to be more, to be a father of many nations, he says to Jacob, I got to change your name. I got to change your name. You can no longer be known as the man who just grabs heels. You need to be the man who grabs hearts. I need to change your name to Israel. I need to change the name to Israel, and through this name, this lineage will come, and your son, Benjamin, will be the leader of a tribe of Israel. Through the tribe of Benjamin, a tribe of Israel, great men came, including King Saul. King Saul 
was one of the descendants that came through the tribe of Benjamin. Now, most times we only spend our time studying the later part of King Saul's life, which did not end very well for him. But the beginning of his reign as king was godly, and it was holy, and it was just, it was right. He would never have come that way through a tribe of Benoni. In fact, I don't know if Benjamin would have ever, Benoni would have ever lived to reach leadership status. Because one thing about living in a life of trouble and pain, become quite suicidal. The worst part of living in pain is the thought of waking up the next day still in pain. Nobody wants to follow that person. People want to follow someone with strength and with courage and with power and honor. And Jacob gives Benjamin a name that puts him in a position that that Jesus lives in. The Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for us, the son of my strength. And I begin to ask myself, what kind of name has our Father given us? What kind of name has our Father given us? And in Philippians 2, 8 and 9, it says this, And he, Jesus, being found in the appearance as of a man, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this obedience, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. And I love how this words it. And gave him the name, not just a name, but gave him the name, the only name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the name that he gave Jesus. And then you know what Jesus does? He turns around and says, now I give you the authority to use my name. In my name. He shall cast out demons. In my name, he shall trample on serpents. In my name, he shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In my name. In my name. I think many times we're using the wrong name. Do you know what name we use a lot? I can't. I hate that. Oh, you want to see me get righteous? Say that in front of me. Oh, I can't do that. And me, I'm saying, how do you know you can't do that? Who told you you can't do that? Did you ever try to do that? Well, no, I can't do that because I'm not mechanically inclined. How do you know? Because you tried to change a tire once and didn't know how? We believe these things. We believe these identities and we begin to confess things and give ourselves other names than what God gave us names to use. A few months ago, uh, last winter, I was driving home. I was driving up the mountain uh, uh, up here towards Sullivan County. And uh, during that, or earlier that day, I was praying. Someone called in. I was going through something, so I was praying for them. And, and God gave me a word about the name of Jesus. Hey, he says, you know, remember. He says to me, remember that the name of Jesus, it's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, everything stops and listens to your direction. That's what the Lord said to me. So I'm thinking, all right, God gave me that to tell that person, right? So don't we do this a lot? God says that we hear something, we think something, oh, that must be for somebody else because it's not really for me. I don't need that right now. Driving home, and it, it was raining down here, but up on the mountain, it was ice. Ice was coming down. And I was getting off of exit 113, uh, no, 114. It's up on top of the hill. And as I took the exit, the whole exit ramp was ice. Now, you know, snow, you might have a chance to get yourself out of, but ice, you're done. There ain't nothing you're doing once you hit that ice. And I lose control of my car. There's no brakes. There's no steering. There's nothing. And in a split second, I mean, maybe my car is sliding for a second and a half, two seconds. It felt like 22 minutes. 
I mean, I had a whole conversation with God in that 1.2 seconds, you know what I'm saying? And it came to me like a flood. Remember, remember the name of Jesus, more powerful than any other name. Because I'll be honest with you, sometimes in those scary situations, other things want to come out your mouth than that. That's real life. But in that moment, remember the name of Jesus, and at the name of Jesus, things stop. It was like slow motion. I mean, I know the car is out of control. I look to my left, and I'm coming off the, the ramp, and there's a car coming up the, the main road. So I'm going out, and they're coming up. We're going to T-bone. It, it's it's going to happen. And I'm kind of looking, I'm like, you know, like, my eyes closed like this. And I didn't even say the name of Jesus with authority. It was like, in the name of Jesus, because I knew it was going to happen. It was more like, yeah! All my man cards went out the window with this high-pitched squeal. I know. At the name of Jesus, my car turned sideways out of the way of the oncoming vehicle. I hit my lane now on the other side of the road sideways, and it was like I hit rails, like on a, uh, a roller coaster. My car's like, Arr! and I just kept driving. It just slid me right into my lane and kept me going perfectly where I needed to be. Arr! Something out of Fast and Furious, you know what I mean? And I know we can sit here, yeah, okay, whatever. I'll give it to God. Use God as your crutch. I'll use that crutch all day long. All day long, all day long, I will give him the glory and the praise because I know that at the name of Jesus, I was out of control and I gained control. I know, I know, I know in me, in me, I know that when I used it, something happened, something changed. I will tell you, in your own life, if you look back and you've ever had to use the name of Jesus in a situation or you've done it, you know that at that moment something changed and no one can steal that from you. No one can take that from you. We could sit back and try to quantify it by whatever reasons, by chance, whatever. That's fine. That's okay. Fine. Whatever. But I believe, I believe that God intervened in my life in that moment because he gave me a name to use. I wonder how many times we should have used the name and we didn't. Didn't work out the way we thought we planned because we just stopped for a moment and take that authority that Jesus gave us. God gave, gave Jesus a name above every name, then Jesus turns around and he gave us that name to use. The idea today is this, and maybe it might be time for a name change. It might be time for a name change from the things that you've been calling yourself to child of God. Child of God, believer, saint, Christian. It might be time to use the name that the Father gave us in situations in our life and actually do what he tells us to do. We're in a season right now that we have never seen before. Pestilence and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. I mean, this is some, this is some biblical stuff at revelation level if we want to get into it that could freak some people out. It might be a time that we begin to hit our knees in a different way and not beg God to do something, but we begin to use the name of Jesus that he gave us in the situations of our lives. Amen. I'd like to pray for you today. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this time in your word today. We thank you that your word will never return unto you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it out to do. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the next season, this new season that you have in store for us. Give us wisdom guidance, direction. Let us have discernment into your word and into the spirit to know what you're saying to us and what you're speaking to us. Holy Spirit, we give you access to our lives, into our hearts to speak to us and guide us. As we leave here today, Lord, we are blessed. We are the head and not the tail above and ever beneath. Everything we set our hands to will prosper 
and be successful. We were blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Have a great weekend.